Good morning. Uh, my name is Brad Van Horn. Uh, I'm part of the uh, PEO UNW Advanced Technology Team. Uh, welcome to day three of the PEO UNW uh, industry event 2023. A lot of you were here with us for day one and day two. For the, the folks that are with us uh, for the first time today, welcome. I'm going to run through this uh, very quickly, just cover the admin stuff. Uh, we'll get right to it uh, with the uh, admiral's remarks uh, here in just a minute. Um, slide, please. Next. Um, bottom line is, I'm not going to read the slide. We got a lot of folks uh, that have been here over the last couple of days and a lot of folks here today. Uh, we've got a um, very robust agenda again for day three. Uh, slide. We're going to try and uh, our breaks will always be at least 20 minutes um, to give you plenty of time to recharge your coffee cups, um, use a restroom, bathrooms. As you come out of this door for the people uh, in this room, uh, just turn to the right and they're just about uh, maybe uh, 40, 50 feet down on your right hand side. Uh, refreshment locations, coffee is in the open air lab where you came in and um, did your check in. Uh, there's water bottle refill stations and uh, there's a vending machine uh, right past the bathrooms as well. Lunch, we've got an hour and 30 minutes for you to get the lunch. We've got a uh, sheet out there in the uh, where you checked in. If you're not uh, familiar with the area, if you're not local, that's got about 70 different um, uh, restaurants in the area that serve lunch. So all of those are within a five mile radius. So getting to and from lunch should not be an issue. Um, if you can, please carpool uh, out to lunch and back. Just makes it a whole lot easier uh, with the parking. Um, just have your ID on your uh, your badge uh, when you come back in. Uh, people will be checking uh, as you come in. Um, the end of the day, um, please uh, drop your name badge in the bin that we have out there. We just we re reuse the plastic things. Uh, just uh, cut down on costs. Um, there's no uh, uh, social event uh, tonight. Um, but um, we had one the last couple nights. I got the chance to talk to a lot of you. Um, the agenda, um, again, a very robust agenda. Every one of our speakers is a subject matter expert uh, in their field. We've got a lot of program managers on the agenda today, both from PEO UNW and PEO USC uh, in the afternoon. So an opportunity to hear directly from the program managers uh, on a lot of their subjects. Um, we will try and stay on time. All of the speakers, uh, I've got a timer that I will have over here. All the speakers will know how much time they have left. We've asked the speakers to, if possible, um, uh, save a few minutes for questions at the end. The exception to that is when the um, uh, the, the PEO UNW program managers uh, are going to start this morning after the Admiral's comments, and each one of them is going to give about 10 minutes, uh, about five minutes or so, on their portfolio, just a quick review, who they are, what they have in their portfolio, and then maybe five minutes on what makes their head hurt and how industry can engage. There won't be any questions for those individual PMs when they're doing their 10 minute talk. They will then sit on a panel that Mr. Dodge, uh, Deputy PEO uh, UNW for uh, Unmanned, um, We'll moderate the panel and you, you'll have an hour to ask all those uh, folks uh, questions. So please uh, hold your questions till the end. Can we uh, put up the agenda, please? Do we have the agenda? Okay. Well, while we're working on getting the uh, agenda, we'll put that app up for um, while the uh, Admiral talks, but we're going to go ahead and uh, uh, here we go. Uh, just very quickly, if we can just page down a little bit, you'll see uh, what our morning is going to look like uh, with uh, each one of the program managers um, getting up and uh, uh, taking a look before we um, go to the panel. So any questions for me? Okay, Admiral. Good morning. Welcome to day three. Uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, sticking with us. Um, today is uh, all about unmanned and autonomy. Um, so let's let's get started. And let's kick that off. Um, 
I also want to thank the, the folks from uh, PEO USC if they're here yet. Otherwise, they'll be here this afternoon to support. Uh, so you can also get an understanding of where they're going in the unmanned surface and unmanned um, subsurface space as well. Um, like I said yesterday morning, uh, we had a great classified session on Tuesday. Just because this is an unclassified session, it does not mean the threat has suddenly changed. OK, uh, it is just as real and just as urgent and present as it always has been. And as we've been talking about, uh, a lot of yesterday's conversation was on the weapons programs, long range fires, that kinetic response piece. Um, the unmanned is the other part that is truly going to help us be in place and to be able to accept a higher level of risk, especially in a non permissive denied environment. Um, the program managers here um, are going to give you uh, the quick rundown of what's in their portfolio, uh, what they are currently working on and what they currently need. Uh, and then you'll have a great opportunity to engage them uh, in the Q&A session led by Mr. Dodge. Um, that, of course, is not your only opportunity. You'll have breaks and other opportunities to engage the program managers as well. Um, as we talk about autonomy, um, to set the stage, a couple of things to think of. Um, one of the things I've been asking for since I've been in the seat uh, about 18 months now is a common taxonomy of language when we talk about autonomy and AI. OK, because everybody here can probably spell it and everybody here will come up with a different definition of what autonomy and AI mean. And we need some consistency. We've recently uh, do have some alignment from OSD that has provided us about five definitions of autonomy, about six definitions of deep learning. Um, so we're getting closer. All right, but we're still not there yet on exactly what all these terms really, really mean. But the biggest thing I want you to think about when we talk about autonomy is trust. OK, um, your GPS in your car is an autonomous system. You plugged in a direction, a, a destination, and it gave you options. It didn't give you infinite options. It gave you options. When it got additional information about traffic, it gave you an alternate route. You had the option of selecting it or not. OK, but it didn't suddenly tell you it just didn't give up on you and change your destination or say, no, I think you actually need to go get some ice cream instead of going to work today. All right. So in our autonomous systems, they can be extremely complex and extremely complex driver trees. OK, and decision trees of how you get through, as we do as humans, the decisions of how we act. But there are still rules and bounds and there's limits to what they can do. We have to be able to test validate and verify each of the branches of that decision tree and autonomy as we're going through a test program to be able to trust the autonomy. And why is that so important? If we feel that we're going to go from an autonomous system to a truly artificially intelligent system that we then intend, intend to give it weapons, now you are broaching a moral ethical boundary, okay, that we may or may not be allowed to cross. But if we don't get the trust right up front, we will never be allowed to get there. OK, so in our autonomous systems, if you're thinking through this, this is not Skynet. We're not talking about Star Trek. We're not talking about the things that Hollywood has put out that look really cool. OK, but we are talking about leading technology and advantages in this space that can truly give us an advantage on the battlefield. OK, you heard uh, late on Tuesday about cooperative combat aircraft. OK, and where we're going that from Commander Bellinghausen, uh, Captain Facito, PMA 268, that's in his wheelhouse. He'll talk more about that later today. Um, you also have unmanned space with uh, 266 and the uh, MQ9s, MQ8s. You have a small family of systems with 263, and then you have Triton with um, 262 with Captain Gear. All right, so you have a lot of opportunities here to talk about where we're going in the unmanned aviation space, and I highly encourage you to take advantage of all of that. But how we get through and establish trust with these systems, and we talk and we talk about unmanned, we always focus about the platform, okay, the thing, all right, realize that there's also a ground control station, there's networks, there are comm channels, there's C2. So un unmanned has created this misnomer that unmanned isn't, manned in reality it's probably twice as much manning when it comes to operating unmanned systems yes there's nobody actually in the vehicle that means that there's a lot of people on the ground okay that are either control command processing information coming off getting information to where it needs to be and all of that process 
Okay, so please, I encourage you to remain engaged today. We got a great uh, program uh, to finish out the industry day on day three with unmanned systems uh, and autonomy. Please ask and, and get your questions answered. Um, look forward to engaging with all of you today. We'll have lots of opportunities for breaks. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we'll bring up each of the program managers um, in order, uh, and then we will get started with the panel. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everybody. So, uh, Captain Josh Gare, I'm the PM for uh, 262, which is the MQ4 uh, Charlie Triton. So, uh, Triton is currently uh, deployed in Seventh Fleet. Uh, we had our IOC last month, which was a significant milestone for the program. As many of you probably know, that have been tracking the program for a while. We had a lot of starts and stops over the last decade, um, but we we were able to successfully finally get to this the key achievement of an IOC in Seventh Fleet. It's built around a uh, what's called an IOC for architecture, so that's a TSSEI architecture, and that was a significant uh, jump from where Global Hawk had previously been with previous variants. So that architecture, um, you know, as, as you can imagine, MQ4 Triton, right, a predominant Northrop Grumman partnership there, a very complex system, but that architecture, that TSSEI architecture is actually an LSI architecture, so lead system integrator here at NAVAIR. So we work with industry partners, Sierra Nevada, Argonne, L3, um, various others, to provide a package that goes to Pax River, right? They each provide their CSEIs. We then integrate that here at Pax River, and that's provided a, on a semi-annual basis. And that's not theoretical. That actually that's actually happened for the last year and a half. We've been providing the fleet actually quarterly releases to drive to, to drive correction of deficiencies. But now we are moving into a, a semi-annual drop based on pace of threat activity. So that's a key node. If you think about it, and we are open for business, right? So that that team in Pax River takes inputs from numerous industry partners outside those vendors I just talked about to bring in key capability in the SIGINT side to drive SIGINT architecture. Um, on the TSSEI side, what we're really predominantly focused on for ISRNT is, as you would imagine, GEOINT, so EOIR, radar, right? But then ELINT, high band, right? Comment, low band. And those are those key key capabilities on the SIGINT side that drive back to the warfighter in the fight. So the concept of operations, I can't go into a lot of detail, but generally what we're talking about is fairly complex, right? So you're not just talking about an air vehicle, which would be your traditional nav air platform, but you're talking about your ground segments that control that air vehicle. You are also talking about watch floors, right? Numerous watch floors that comp that focus on these specific areas, geoint, comment, elint. All of those historically have been strategically aligned. So we're talking about days and months of analysis. They are now moving to a tactical ISRNT focus where we are talking about near real time data analysis and redirection to the crews on where the system goes and where the sensors uh, focus, right? So near real time ISRNT crossing those three swim, swim lanes, GeoInt, Comment, ELINT. And that is another opportunity, frankly. We are the first platform to go into the DSO, distributed signal operations architecture, and many more will follow. So the goal from a, nat a Navy perspective is to drive both sub subsurface, surface, and, and air assets into a common watch floor architecture to drive cross-pollination of data for near real-time execution. Um, so that's, that's huge. Uh, it's also complex, right? So I would say, you know, as we as we talk about the future of the platform and where we continue to work through issues, um, networks, right? Network uh, pipe size and network redundancy. That's that's key. Uh, the future enablers for unmanned, I believe, uh, due to swap C limitations, will be uh, driving sensors onto aircraft and looking at driving pipe size to do po on deck processing of that of those data products. And so that will drive the, the necessity of, of increasing the pipe size that we are utilizing for a lot of our BLOS networks. And so that's key to our future development effort. Triton is now fully funded for an increment two effort over the fit up um, that that branches out to Northrop Grumman, but a lot of other industry partners, including Raytheon and some of the ones I've already mentioned. Uh, so networks will be a huge focus area as we move forward, and it's part of our increment two architecture. Uh, the other area I would focus on is obviously the, the, the key sustainment side maintenance, right? And that's common across all Navier platforms. Uh, the one thing I want to highlight there is I get calls, honestly, three to four calls a, a week from various uh, algorithm shops in the in the in the beltway on new maintenance uh, analysis tools that can be utilized. The key thing to understand is I'm a lowly 06, right? 
So I, I support NAE, right? CNAF tool sets, enterprise tool sets. So when we talk at a program management level, what we would bring to the table, it's not gonna overturn the Apple cart. We're gonna bring additions, right? Supplementary additions that could su supplement enterprise level tools. And so if you're looking to come in and turn the Apple cart, that conversation is really at a double O Airbus level on you know what would the enterprise look to change. I come in, I use those tools and I may supplement those with additions to refine and, and, and provide additional assets specific to Triton. Um, and that's that's important to understand in the sustainment space. Um, the last area I've already talked about, right, which would be that TSSEI development space, right? And we have folks that are working uh, every every week on new concepts coming out of Paycom that we need to address on um, pace the threat activity, which rolls, rolls into those semi-annual software drops. So a lot of key opportunities, I believe, um, not specific to Triton, but common across the, the unmanned architecture to support uh, future fleet needs. That's all I have, thanks. Morning, I am not the uh, 263 program manager. That is Greg Skinner, effective uh, Thursday of last week. My name is Tom Matthews. I'm the Principal Deputy Program Manager of PMA 263. We do small tactical unmanned aircraft systems. Um, we learned on day one that we need to go faster. Uh, our product line, we service a lot of products to the Marine Corps. So with that, we also uh, use Force Design 2030 as our guidance, and that too emphasizes the need to go fast. Ways that we try and go faster in PMA 263, we're going to talk about some of those today, and maybe you'll see an opportunity for your your, your company to jump in. Um, just like your cell phone, technology is changing rapidly. So therefore, we uh, in 263 buy a lot of commercial products. So uh, uh, in our family of smalls, uh, we, we uh, go out every 18 to 24 months, do market research, uh, look for state-of-the-art systems, and with that, uh, we invite industry in through white papers, uh, do some fly-offs, usually U uh, University of Maryland, their unmanned uh, organization around the corner facilitates that, and with that, uh, we, we will do down selects and select uh, new products on a regular basis, and then every 18 to 24 months, we repeat that process, so there's an opportunity for you to jump in if you're in that, that arena. Um, Another way we go fast in 263 is uh, doing a lot of non-traditional contracting and experimentation. Uh, Truaz, you look no further than Truaz. Truaz is our autonomous uh, uh, small, it carries 150 uh, pounds, 10 clicks one way. It's the last tactical mile for the Marines. Uh, we did a prize challenge that led to a couple OTAs. The OTAs resulted in us buying 21 prototypes. The 21 prototypes uh, we put out with the fleet users. Uh, they played with it at, at Camp Lejeune. They played with it at uh, 29 Palms. We sent some over to the Philippines to see how they operate in theater. We did a little o OT, and then with that, did, did a production decision. So prize challenge to award three years. We are starting to deploy these things next month to CLB6 and LLB3 will deploy with them. So another way we're going fast. Uh, behind Truaz is our medium autonomous uh, unmanned platform. It's going to carry 300 to 600 pounds, 100 clicks one way. Again, we use OTAs. Uh, two vendors are doing prototypes. 18 months later, that's going to culminate in a fly off. We're going to do a down select and move forward with that one from a production perspective. So ways that we are looking to work with industry to go fast, to deliver capabilities to the fleet. Staying with the theme of going fast, we are also partnering a lot with our field activities and labs, China Lake, Airworks, ONR, APL, McWill, uh, working with them. You have to look no further than what we're doing with Blue Water. Uh, Military Sea Left Command came to us and said, hey, uh, warship readiness status is pr primarily uh, driven by a need for small electronic parts. 90% of those parts are 50 pounds or less. Can you guys autonomously deliver a capability uh, ship to shore, ship to ship. And we worked with Airworks, awarded a couple OTAs and proved that concept. We also took that capability to uh, 
Fleet Battle Problem 23, and we're also taking it to RIMPAC 24 here in, in 24. Um, another opportunity where we worked with our labs and, 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 and uh, field activities is our maritime ISR targeting capability. So VCNO challenged us, hey, uh, here's the scenario. I got a DDG, it's sitting out there in MCON. Can you launch a UAS, uh, have it do some targeting and send track quality data back to the DDG in an MCON state? Uh, we, we have broken this down into phases. Phase one, we're attacking here. We attacked in 23, phase two, we're attacking here in 24. But again, another way that we're working with our labs, working with our partners, to uh, expedite getting capability to the fleet. Another, another way that we are, are learning more about what we're doing and, and unmanned is, is watching what happened in Ukraine. Uh, unmanned has made a huge difference in Ukraine. So not only how they're deploying them, um, how they're replacing them, so from a maintenance sustainment concept, uh, we're learning a lot there. And then uh, some of the the uh, assured PNT solutions that they're using in Ukraine, we're looking maybe to port over some of our unmanned systems. Um, when we really want to go fast in PMA 263, we have a services component of what we do. Um, that's sir, we provide ISR services on land. So in support of CENTCOM and the Combined Joint Task Force OIR, we have uh, service, COCO services in the desert to support operations. We also have uh, ISR services at sea. So on DDG, DDG 1000, LCSs, and ESB ships, we have uh, services. Um, with the divestment of RQ21 that created a capability gap for the Muse, so that we are standing up X2S, which is our expedi expeditionary tactical UAS uh, effort. Um, that's a service that'll they'll help the Muse uh, ashore, or afloat, move to ashore, giving them a risk of capability that they they no longer have with the divestment of RQ21. Um, so that those are opportunities that we have out there in that arena to go fast and, and provide services to the fleet when they're not really ready to, uh, to make a monetary decision long-term, we provide that interim solution to fill a capability gap. Um, all of what I talked about today, the working with the labs, working with the, the field activities, the constant market research, the experimentation, all that feeds back to uh, our advanced development and payloads group, uh, helping them be informed and understand where our capability gaps are, and then working again with the labs, with industry, uh, JCTDs, SIBRs, and whatever other tools they have in their toolkit to go fill those uh, those holes. Um, what's making our head hurt in PMA 263? So swap C conscious mature payloads and sensors that that comply with uh, open architecture open architecture standards for integration into our products. Um, extended range and endurance that comes in many flavors that could be alternate propulsion and fuel systems, or it could be improvements in battery technology. Uh, swap conscious uh, AI ML uh, edge edge uh, computing solutions, uh, assured PNT solutions for our operations in contested environments, sense and avoid sensors, and autonomous solutions for shipboard operations. However, I'll foot stomp one thing. Uh, Technical maturity and and cost means a lot to us. For example, we're buying that at 330k a copy. Makes no sense for me to put a 500k assured PNT solution on that, right? So these are all considered attributable systems. So we are very conscious about what the cost is, and uh, tech maturity is important because we have low R&D budgets. So we're really just looking to integrate mature technology into our platforms, not develop anything from the ground up. That's all I have. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Captain Dennis Monagle, call sign Fester for obvious reasons. Welcome, welcome to Pax River. Uh, serendipitously, I think that's a word I got placed between Josh and Tom. Very high altitude, long endurance. And then Tom, I think your stuff is mostly low altitude, although I'm not read in. So here we are. I'm the program manager for the medium altitude, long endurance, or the tactical UAS uh, uh, 
portfolio of systems. So I think on your screen, you see uh, my, my pinwheel here. I'll talk mostly about Fire Scout today. I know the Mux Mail is very interesting. I'll talk about that. I only have 10 minutes and that's unfortunate. All right, so let's talk about Fire Scout first. So we, as you may know, we used to fly the MQ-8B. It was kind of like the little minion that was attached to LCS and it was really did 20 years of good flying. I think we did 19,000 hours when we put it to bed last year. So the Navy is elected to only go to the MQ-8C. So what you see there is a Bell 407, really commercial aircraft uh, that has been seats ripped out, flight controls ripped out, all that good stuff ripped out. People like me aren't needed anymore, for, former rotary wing aviator. Uh, and then, uh, you, you put a bunch of sensors on it, then you have a unmanned uh, ISR platform. All right, so uh, 7 million flight hours on the Bell 407, very well known, good Bell product, uh, good partnership with Bell and Northrop Grumman to make this thing work. Uh, lots of uh, at sea testing. It's uh, either a LCS or SEAC or suitably equipped air capable ship. Right now, I think we're able to fly on ESBs if you're familiar with the expeditionary staging bases. We got a couple of a couple of them out there. They were really weird looking ships, but when you put a weird looking UAS on it, then it fits together very well, very capable platform. Uh, so right now we have a total of 38 aircraft that were purchased. We have uh, 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 almost half of those deployed on the West Coast right now, supporting uh, LCS uh, independence class. That's the, the trimaran, the pointy nose looking one to, to do uh, uh, good things for America right now. There are two deployed as we speak. Uh, and the way that the H, uh, correction, the MQ-8 deploys is with the H-60 Sierra. So they deploy one Sierra and then they deploy one Fire Scout and together with the LCS, they make a family assistant. Uh, systems out there uh, doing maritime ISR for whatever fleet commander uh, needs the data. So from my perspective, and I'm interested in conversations uh, with industry, uh, how do we make Fire Scout a, a little bit better, right? Uh, how do we make it a more usable ISR asset, right? Just to, to, to beyond LCS, right? So I'm a hel helicopter guy and I, I've landed in the, the sand dunes of uh, Saudi Arabia, the uh, the deserts over there. So my, my point is it's a super expeditionary uh, piece of gear. We've done a lot on the fleet's done a lot with that as well. So being, being a helicopter by its very nature is an expeditionary capability, right? So I think a lot of Navy thought has been just a sea-based capability, which is great. You can have both. Let's think abundantly, right? So you're able uh, to do expeditionary ISR with Fire Scout as well. We've proven it. And then at the same time, we're, what we're working on is modularizing or really minim I don't know, minimalizing is not the right word. Making it smaller, let's talk faster, simple words here, right? So we're, we've gone to uh, the Mission Control Station Portable, which is a, a great piece of gear that you can put under a tent. Uh, we have the uh, CDL antennas and the UHF antennas that we need, and, and you can get Fire Scout pretty well off the shore to do maritime ISR, uh, humanitarian assistance, disaster support, whatever that you want it to do, it can do. So there's a lot of trade space from my perspective, interested in uh, industry conversations, through our advanced development team or through the white paper process or whoever means we want to talk about how we can make Fire Scout a little bit better as far as an ISR asset. So lots of stuff going on with future vertical lift or uh, VTOL, uh, family of systems, all that uh, future development. I want you to imagine Fire Scout as a bridge to both of those, right? Especially on the FVL, the, unc the uncrewed portion of it. You, we, we as an enterprise, we as taxpayers have invested hundreds of millions of dollars in Fire Scout program stand up. You have an active depot. You have an active supply chain. You have active NAP subcontracts for it as well. So that may be a good area to continue investment in as, as Fire Scout is a, a bridge to those systems, right? And that way we, 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 we've contained the life cycle costs. We don't have to redo that until a certain point in the future. So uh, from my perspective, again, Fire Scout pretty wide open for what it can do. Uh, think man truck flying uh, around 16,000 feet, which if you're a helicopter pilot, that's pretty high. I like to be uh, 100 feet and below, but Fire Scout can actually pretty well fly up uh, above that. And if I'm not going to give you the radar formula, but the higher you go, the, the better your radar performs, right? And I will I, I will close Fire Scout out a little bit. It has a world-class maritime uh, radar on it. It's a Leonardo, so I'll give you, I'll give you a fist pump it for, from Leonardo. Uh, the Osprey 30, we call it the Zippy 8, a super capable radar with multi modes uh, for maritime ISR. Little plug, it has uh, uh, what we know as Minotaur in the background running that, and that's the only rotary wing platform that has Minotaur right now, so let's use it to an advantage. All right, drum roll. Let's talk about Mux Mail, which is the MQ-9. That's the MAGTAF unmanned expeditionary. 
uh, medium altitude, long endurance. So that's what you hear for muck smell. So picture Reaper. You guys know the Reaper, right? It's been around for 20 years. A great General Atomics product. It's also known as the Predator B. Uh, I think we're just going to call it Reaper in the Marine Corps because it's simple to do that, right? So uh, the difference in uh, tactical utilization or strategic utilization even is that it's not a hunter-killer drone. It's more of a hunter drone at this point. So the Marine Corps has really dipped their uh, toe into the ISR world. Uh, so a lot of the stuff that Josh or Captain Gear talked about for ISR Thank you very much. We're following your footsteps as you paved the way for unmanned ISR, right? With our with our joint partners and everybody else, we're doing the same thing. So there's a couple of really good capabilities on the uh, the Mux Mail platform. There'll be there'll be an EW capability on there. There's a maritime domain awareness uh, uh, world class uh, sensor that we're developing right now. Uh, this is one of the the few big wing uh, unmanned systems that will have a detect and avoid system. Uh, so that's a really uh, uh, interesting thing that we're going to start testing. Uh, here we're already uh, starting to develop the kits and buy the kits. So uh, the further your aircraft gets away from the field, the more risk you have because people like me, and I have bad eyes, I, I, I'm vision corrected, you can't see what's out there, right? You don't want to have a collision. For the, for the case of 262, they have a great safety case because they're up in the stratosphere, right? It's where where I, as I said, the medium altitude long endurance is not, right? So we're really, really uh, uh, on the forefront of greatness for detect and avoid uh, and the, the certification that goes with that because there is a due regard requirement. Uh, so we're working that right now. Uh, other uh, capabilities on that, um, uh, we're working closely with the Air Force for agile uh, combat employment. What I hate is that the Air Force is ahead of the Marine Corps for, uh, you know, agile or uh, expeditionary capability, but we're working hand in hand, but we're super leveraged and highly uh, uh, aligned with what the Air Force are doing at the Reapers. Think big brother, little brother, brother programs, right? But I think uh, very soon we'll be out on our own doing uh, interesting stuff that the Air Force doesn't do. So that's what the enterprise is doing right now for Muxmail or for MQ-9. We're really making sure there's a lead horse somewhere and that we're all not doing the same things, right? Because as taxpayers, that's really dissatisfying. So just so you know, we're working closely with the uh, Air Force on that. I could talk forever. I I won't. I, I think I'll end up for the for the as we go to higher load payloads for for Mux Mail. We also need to uh, up up the security level for our, our mission control system. So we're doing that. Um, right before I was selected for this job, I was over at your predecessor's job, silly over in MQ25. Uh, let me tell you, these folks are leading the way as far as mission control systems, multi-level security, and all the C4I infrastructure that goes with that. So I will stop by saying today, lots of lessons learned for what Silly is doing in his program, all the multi-level security stuff, all the network stuff that we're doing as a DOD joint enterprise. Um, all the stuff that Josh is doing for, for distributed saying sing ops and all the seams that we need to, to, to play with with Tom and his group to make sure that on, on our unmanned portfolio side, we all work very closely together. And I'm not going to want to duplicate a lot of the stuff that they do. So if you're talking to them, feel free to pick up the phone and talk to me as well. I might not have a direct link with you. Happy to send you to my uh, cohorts down down the uh, down the hallway. So I talked too much. I think the the, the timer of death has one minute to go. Uh, I will leave you with that. I look forward to uh, talking with you outside the spaces or during the panel. Thanks for your time today. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Can anyone point me to the donut table? Because I didn't see it on the way in and, uh, and I could probably use it. This thing is going to fall. Negative stability margins. OK, Josh, quick question. Were you were you P3s? So that's very interesting because we have. I'm Captain Dan Facito, call sign if you're silly. Uh, probably won't answer to anything but that kind of like Basta, but uh, F-18 driver by trade, legacies in the fleet. Supers and growlers and test been an acquisition over 15 years. So I think it's very interesting that we have carrier based Hornet, P3 and Hilo all trying to put ourselves out of a job here. So that's that's really not lost on me. But what a great brotherhood, as you've just heard in terms of all of us trying to work together to bring this asymmetric advantage uh, to the United States as a whole, right, in support of national defense. So there's a timer down there. I'll endeavor never to look at it because I'll probably talk for the rest of the day. Joking, Mr. Dodge, I will watch the time. Uh, what a great brotherhood. And thank you for being here today 
uh, the opportunity to chat with all of you from industry on how to make that uh, a definite reality. As you heard, I'm a, uh, the newbie on the stage, the program manager for Unmanned Carrier Aviation, PMA 268, home of the mighty MQ-25A Stingray, and I'm not gonna talk about that first. I'm gonna talk about it last. Because the most important thing that we are doing in PMA 268, the capability we are really bringing to the fleet, and that is an extremely important capability, MQ-25, is the ground station, the C4I, the networks, the outfitting of the carriers, the outfitting of our, our uh, shore-based ground stations and maybe beyond to make sure that whatever widget needs to plug into unmanned carrier aviation can do so. All right, so we'll talk a lot about that today. A fantastic team on that side of the house. They are responsible for outfitting all of the carriers. They're responsible for getting VUQ-10, 11, and 12 set up. VUQ-10 is starting right here at Pax River in our beautiful ITT hangar. Uh, hopefully I can get a chance to bring everyone down there to, uh, to see it. We had our first four air vehicle pilots winged at Pensacola back in May. That was amazing. MQ-25 really stole the show down there, those four, first four brave souls, right, moving out to start an entirely new community. And then we'll stand up uh, the, the ground facilities at Norfolk and out in Point Magoo. So all these things are areas of interest to me, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. The MQ-25, I think everyone knows we are a little delayed. Remember, it was an accelerated acquisition program. Right, we uh, we just restructured the program to move IOC from 2025 to 2026. That is still in line with supporting the fleet. Gives us more time to train those AVPs, more time to ring out the MQ-25 and flight test and make sure we get a fantastic product to the fleet, but we're not gonna spend forever doing it. So when we talk about going fast, when we talk about doing flight test, uh, we'll have areas to ask for in that regime as well. So, she's up there, you love to look at her. Anyone realize how large that aircraft is? Anyone actually seen it? I don't think it would fit nose to tail across this conference room and the wings are 75 feet. So it's E2 wingspan. It is F-18 length, over a little over 55 feet, I think. And our job is to seamlessly integrate that large group five UAV with the carrier deck the most dynamic flight environment in the world. We are not asking the carrier to change. We're going to we're going to seamlessly integrate as if I was still in that cockpit. All right. So you can imagine the tremendous challenges that we have with a brand new community, ground control, C4I and a very large aircraft that's supposed to take a lot of gas a long way and deliver it to our strike fighters so they can do the job. So what is hurting my head? Obviously, she doesn't look like any tanker that we built before, right? So uh, in a non-permissive environment, being able to take gas forward into a tested area is important. So when we talk about signatures, we talk about reducing signatures, we talk about the ability to penetrate, uh, maybe not sustain or maybe not uh, go all the way uh, to, the, to the target area, but be permissive in that denied environment. RF signatures are of, of concern to me. So anything we can do, active or passive, to try and make her look very small in anyone's radar scope is extremely important. Love to talk about it because that gas can hang out a lot longer for our folks. She's an autonomous air vehicle, so not a drone. The AVPs, they have a stick and throttle. I think if I was an AVP, it'd just be there to make me feel good. They don't move, right? When we launch MQ-25, she goes on her mission, she executes her mission, and the AVPs monitor. So think about getting her around mobility-wise in the United States. Has to operate in the national airspace. Is going to have to operate in international airspace at some point. So when we start talking about autonomy, and the Admiral had a great point on what is autonomy, what are we really looking for? Uh, one of the big things is sense and avoid. How do we have that aircraft autonomously sense and avoid other things in national airspace? Uh, we have tremendous tools today to operate uh, with the FAA, but the aircraft still needs to have some ability to replace these two Mark 1, now Mod 2 eyeballs, right, to make sure that it is it is safe up there. And it is safe but we need to have that sort of fallback that the aircraft can see and avoid on its own. We hear a lot about precision nav and timing, everything we do today, right? So in a denied environment where maybe GPS denied, what do we have out there as a backup? Robust doesn't always mean that the unit itself is strong. Sometimes robust for MQ-25 could mean that I have multiple ways of getting that information. So alternate means of PNT, precision nav and timing, 
uh, extremely important to what we're trying to do to be persistent. We talked a lot about AI. What is AI? I'm open. I'm willing to listen and hear. Uh, I think we're all trying to build that encyclopedia on what is the definition, what is AI, if you were to bring it all down. So whatever you have, I'm love love to hear about it right today. 500 miles from the ship, obviously, I don't have line of sight communications with the aircraft. So beyond line of sight communications, whether that's SATCOM or some of the means that I haven't heard of yet, uh, really, really interested in talking about that, especially robust and easily integrated SATCOM solutions, right? We'll talk a little bit about manned on man teaming, MUMT. How is this going to operate seamlessly, not just on the carrier deck, but with airborne aircraft while it's out there? Uh, we think a lot of times of MUMT in terms of loyal wingman, little buddies hanging out with us. We joked about the movie Stealth this morning, but as we go into different levels of manned unmanned teaming, we start talking about how do I have an MQ-25 that's 400 miles away from me, but still working in concert with man fighters out there to prosecute the mission? Optical systems are really big. Uh, in a former life, I was the F-18 Block 2 Erst uh, IPT lead. So we all know that there is an optic side to the fight. We were very radar centric for a long time, but optical systems are extremely powerful. There is a large optics ball in the front of this aircraft. She is going to have a nascent and as we move along, well-developed ISR capability. Optics are going to be a big part of that. So any advanced optics technology that includes processing of optics, right? So there's always a brain behind the radar. There's a brain behind the optics too. How do we do surface search? How do we do airborne search? You know, how do we bring those capabilities to the fight? And then in my last couple of minutes, I'd really like to talk about technologies you may have that can help us go faster in the test and evaluation and you know it's not the cloud but it's it's data control data analytics is probably the word i'm looking for we still have to move fast and test all right we can't spend years ringing this platform out so when we talk about uh, data management tools how can i analyze flight test data in hours and not days we have to fly pretty much every day of the week with our aircraft now being an old tester i know that's hard You'd fly, you'd get the data, you'd go down for three days, they'd analyze the data, is it good? Can you go back up? Yep, okay, let's go back up. It's not gonna cut it. So anything that you have that could help us see, digest, analyze, download, not just the ones and zeros, but the health of the data system on the aircraft, because there's nothing worse than going on a test flight and finding out your data system didn't work or the strain gauges you needed were not working. So things like that to continually groom the aircraft to be as efficient as possible in that. And there's one thing that's come to my attention very recently as we we're writing software. Obviously there's a lot of software. Uh, is that a surprise? No, sorry. A lot, a lot of software going into an autonomous air vehicle. But software kind of in an old fashioned way, we code it. But as I'm getting smarter in industry, there's automated coding, there's AI testing, right? To shorten that OODA loop of, I wrote the code, I'm testing the code, I'm verifying the code, and we're moving out quicker. So please come find me today. I want to meet you all. Please come shake my hand. Grab me by the donut table, which is, I'm sorry, where, but, uh, <laughs> but seriously, let's have a great conversation about this and where we think we can get enablers to move this strongly into the future. So very much looking forward to it. Looking forward to the panel. Morning, everybody. I'm Captain Jarek Black, call sign Chopper. Uh, so adding an S3 uh, 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 to the mix was my first platform. So uh, in a way, Stingray also passing gas to the air wing is, uh, is a mission I'm really uh, familiar with uh, and then doing a whole lot more in the sea control world. world. Uh, I'm the program manager for PMA 281. So strike planning and execution systems uh, found in the upper left hand side of the chart there. Uh, so where do I come into the unmanned aviation uh, side of the house? So I'm responsible for all of the mission planning uh, that occurs across 40 type model series. Uh, and then it gets a little bit different uh, with our uh, with our UAV uh, brethren um, because it gets a lot more exciting. 
Uh, it's a really cool place and a fun place to be in uh, naval aviation. When you look at the cutting edge uh, technologies I get to work with my partners on uh, to field. So I get a pretty cool job in UNW is I get to just support all of them. I get to try to find enablers in areas where it's going to assist them uh, in getting platforms out there. And usually we refer to PMA 281 as the digital glue uh, in PEO UNW. So software centric uh, solutions, looking at how we use information technology um, ideas to bring that mission planning stuff that's gonna be right in front of uh, aviators uh, to work on that man on man teaming problem. Uh, yeah, problem uh, opportunity. So we have one area uh, that you'll see is called Arcane, uh, that where we have a heritage to the CCS program. If anybody knows that one, it was a common control system. Uh, and we still have a requirement there to do executive control of unmanned aerial vehicles. And we've created a focus on uh, autonomy, looking at how we take uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, how we work uh, to provide standards and work with all our teammates to bring definition to the open mission standards that we need uh, to kind of glue all of these components together. Um, that means uh, evaluating uh, core technologies and looking at uh, a lot of the software side of the house is how could we do some ubiquitous DevSecOps development, security, and operations of the software that's going to be the di uh, digital glue uh, and help lead uh, where all of our unmanned air vehicles and weapon systems are going to be so that when they uh, are ready to do a really fast pace, the stuff that Silly was talking about, uh, delivering uh, automated tests of of code, um, bringing industry software best practices and lessons learned uh, to the fight uh, and into our acquisition systems. I have a team uh, that has a requirement and is focused on those types of things. So uh, industry head herders there for me are how to do that at multiple security levels. Uh, how do I take great solutions that are at the aisle four, aisle five, uh, kind of maturity level and figure out how to promote those up or move them up and down, how to build agile software development teams um, and make sure that they're plugged into what the user needs uh, as far as mission planning uh, opportunities. And then as we know, there's just a ton of exciting stuff that's happening uh, in the unmanned space and in the, the AI space at the same time. So uh, a, a fun time to be interfacing. I think I'll give some time back uh, to the crowd. Um, that's what I have. Come, come swing by me if you got solutions that'll help. Okay, we're ahead of schedule this morning. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and take a 25 minute break. Uh, we will be back at uh, 9.15 and we'll start the panel.
Okay, welcome back. Um, saw long lines over here, folks trying to uh, uh, get a minute with our uh, program managers on the UAS side. Uh, we've got a panel. If it's something that uh, you can ask that's not proprietary or whatever, uh, and everybody might benefit from that, uh, we ask that you uh, bring those questions, stand up and ask questions. We've got a, uh, an hour. We're a little bit ahead of schedule, so we may uh, go a little bit longer if we have enough questions. And I'd ask the uh, uh, the PMs as well as if you got a question that you think that everybody can benefit from and it wasn't something proprietary, uh, please let us know and, and uh, let, let the folks online and the rest of the folks in the room uh, benefit from that. So with that said, Mr. Dodge, gentlemen. Thank you again. I'm Jeff Dodge, the uh, deputy for unmanned aviation at POU and W. Um, I, I just wanted to take a moment while everyone's getting settled and and uh, you just highlight a couple things. Um, we showed our portfolio pinwheel up here. Um, and although I've been in the PEO for 10 years and, and really believe in the mission of unmanned aviation, I hate that pinwheel uh, because it doesn't show the important stuff, right? We showed uh, a whole bunch of air vehicles. Um, but air vehicles is not what we deliver, and it's not the most interesting and or the hardest thing of what we do. What's not depicted is the software code. What's not depicted are the communication networks. Uh, what's not depicted is the command and control. That's what really makes unmanned aviation work. Uh, and you heard it in all of our uh, PMs and kind of the discussion of the challenges. Uh, that's really where our focus is ac across. The other thing that uh, I'm really proud to be part of this team because the level of collaboration across platforms and across the portfolios is higher than it's ever been. Uh, there is a pressure to deliver a particular uh, end item. That's how we get our requirements. That's how we get our funding. Uh, that's how we're measured. Uh, but this group has really worked hard to make sure that lessons are learned across and that we're leveraging uh, knowledge and technology across. And the last thing I want to talk about is uh, the idea of what makes naval unmanned air systems different than anybody else. And that's this idea of mission assurance. Uh, we have a requirement that our unmanned systems actually do what they're supposed to do, uh, both on mission, which may be far away from uh, any other services, and then in particular, when they're in the close in operating environment. There is no way a naval unmanned air system does not close come close to manned aircraft or to human beings uh, because they're always at least landing on the ship or coming back into the FARP or the, uh, you know, where the Marines are stationed. And so that mission assurance, that reliability that they're going to do what they want in close and on final is, is also critically important to us. And so some of the lead times that we have and some of the issues that we have are particular to that level of how do we uh, get that mission assurance, how do we contain the automation, how do we make sure that it's tested and evaluated? That those are concerns that we have, and we'll kind of talk about that as we go. So while we're still waiting for uh, questions to come in, um, I'm going to start asking the, the, the pillar and our panel, and uh, then we'll go from there. So first off, I, the Admiral this morning talked about the manpower concerns for unmanned aviation. Could some of you talk about how you're addressing uh, the manpower concerns, uh, either through automation or through non-traditional operators. So I'll start. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Lower it too, a little short. Okay, so uh, uh, our vision for what we're providing to the Marine Corps is uh, Every Marine out there will will be a uh, an operator, right? So I was down at Tulsa East two weeks ago. Um, a young Marine, 18 years old, 10 months out of high school, is flying our Sky Raider. And uh, two months prior to that, he was trained on how to to uh, to mission plan our Truez system. I think that's remarkable that uh, a young Marine that Predominantly, his he's a ground guy. His predominant job was to drive trucks. Is going to be one of the operators here for CLB six. So the ease of operation uh, is, is important to us. Um, I asked him which one he liked best, and he said Sky Raider because he actually gets to fly it. Where with Truez, he just pushed the button and off it goes, and it comes back. To that, to him, that was boring. 
he's a video gamer, so he liked to play with the buttons. Uh, but obviously, the autonomous piece of that is where we want to get to, so we do push that button, it gets its mission done and comes back. But, you know, from an 18 year old, he wants to have hands on the button. So I, I thought that was interesting. So ease of use is very important to us. And uh, and and again, to the lowest level, making them operators, that, that is the vision. We are giving our products to the ground community and uh, they are not trained pilots. So we have to be able to make that easy for them to, to use in theater. You sound like you had something to say. Yes, I don't know if this is really a mitigation dodger. It's just underlying the Admiral's point. So um, the, the complexity of the systems is obviously a huge, a huge factor. So we are we are organic uh, maintenance construct, right? O level maintainers. Um, I think the uh, the complexity of the system is a huge challenge. And particularly if you think about your AT and your IT rates, right? Trying to bring in an AT from another platform where they've never really dealt with the complexity of an unmanned system has been significant. It's taken us honestly about two years to get an AT up to speed on at a QA level, QAR level on what they need to do to support the, the system. ITs are even worse, right? So an IT coming into an environment where they never dealt with airworthiness, right? These are folks that likely were on a ship working on your average computer and now you bring them in and have them try to figure out how to support airworthiness in a ground segment, right? And understand all those complexities in the 4790 it's just a huge challenge. So the the mitigation is we we've had to really drive uh, industry support, right? FSRs. Um, the other areas that I'll highlight that have been have predominantly required industry involvement have been some of our TSSEI systems, which again complexity, right? So we are pushing Sierra Nevada FSRs forward, Argon FSRs forward, to drive at um, helping these operators understand these complex TSSEI systems and how to make them operate. And it's been critical. Um, that extends into the whole supply chain, right? So if you go to your traditional EP3, right, a low band chassis would go bad, what what would they do? The AT would pull it out, pop open the top, pull a card and replace it. We we did not have that in place, right? So we, we were essentially gonna have to take these boxes, ship them back to the States and then do a normal rotation. So we've had to go and start to stand up uh, uh, test equipment, right? Where where eight where, where these FSRs that were that were bringing in from Sierra Nevada and Argonne are also dual hatted maintenance folks, right? Um, eye level maintenance, where they can pull a box off a Triton, take it over to a test bench, and and do that kind of swap over. So a lot of muscle movements that I never really thought I would be contending with that are necessary um, um, in order to make the systems work, right? And 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 drive that that mission assurance that Dodger's talking about. I'll say on the um, kind of on the software-ish side. Uh, so one of the plans with uh, Arcane, which I didn't spell out the acronym when I was standing up there, the architecture and capabilities for autonomy and naval aviation, uh, and and really us the the term meaning something that is not often understood, something that is mysterious uh, uh, and difficult to understand. Is why the team picked the term, and. Uh, what we're, our aim is, is to reduce cognitive workload in an environment that might be a highly contested um, situation. Like say, you know, you've got uh, fighters that are engaging and now in the future, and we're very much looking at the future, you've got um, some little buddies out there that can, you know, provide protection um, uh, and be at the front end of the battle. Well, if you're in a, in a Hornet flying at 600 knots, um, you might not have a whole lot of time to like take control and, and play the video game to control those. You just need them to go do what they need to do. And so, and then if the the mission modeling says that, hey, four is really great, but eight is better, or 10 is better, or 12, like ability to swarm or use lots and lots of different uh, um, UAVs. Now that the operator workload, you can't, you can't fly 10 things at once. So how do we bring technology in that is already kind of in the industry space, but get it into a DevSecOps pipeline, a software pipeline where we can do that mission assurance piece, where we can get an airworthy certification, where we can do the cyber safe accreditation, where we can do the things that are not very, not very fun and attractive, but are necessary to make sure that we could put a stamp 
on something that says that our sailor soldiers and, and, and airmen and Marines um, are going to be safe to operate it is I see as a real challenge, a policy challenge, a technology challenge. It's going to take a lot of multidisciplinary equities to come together um, to navigate those spaces. Uh, and so that's an area where uh, we are investing a lot of time and attention in that uh, within 281 uh, to help lead the way, to be ready, uh, to make sure that um, when the, the my unmanned brethren are, are, are kind of ready for that and we're certifying that we've, we've made that path um, more achievable uh, and we need help in, in that area as well. What are some of the things that we can do that with test and evaluation or cool ideas on software that it's we're already thinking about it going to the user and we're already thinking about it's not just going to be an experiment but it's going to have to get certified and that's a mind shift thank you okay um any questions from the floor throw up a hand or stand up so i can see you and then uh, for our online audience, if you uh, type in a question into the Q&A, we'll, uh, we'll process them and get them up here. NSA certification of type one trip, minimum of two years, and maybe eight years. Accelerated employees. So that's kind of a, a been difficult. A lot of people are saying for the actor, yes, that they desire a type one particular note demanding it yet. Policies out there. Um, so is there any is there any initiatives to try to get small? Okay, for online, the, the question was about uh, NSA timelines for type one encryption and, and how it represents a barrier to the delivery of smaller form factor uh, avionics and electronics and whether there's any initiatives ongoing. Um, I don't know if any of you have any. Um, I, I will agree it is a it is an issue that that uh, the only way we've been able to address it in the short run has been uh, pressure on the system to make sure that our stuff floats to the top. Um, I, do you? Yeah, that, this is Chopper here. Um, it, a little bit of a long shot here and where we're looking long for lineup on how we can um, help there. We have an idea, so I won't say this is fully, fully baked, but we see the crypto management topic for aviators in, in general being a hard thing, the certification path. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is how could we take something in the mission planning world? We take a lot of CDs, send them out to the fleet with all this updated data, and then it gets written to a, a brick that's a, either a USB drive or used to be a pick me a card and walks out to the jet and plugs into the jet and loads mission data. Um, and then we also have an SKL that's going out to jet to load all the crypto. And then we have like all these devices. So we have this vision that what if we got it all to one device um, as a long path? And what if crypto management was a component of that? So imagine something that is like uh, a tablet or um, a secure phone in, you know, in my pocket, but it would be a tablet, a mission planning tablet um, that, and we are, investing in and looking at industry ideas on how we could do multi-level encryption on the tablet and then also add crypto management to it. But uh, I'm mostly just speaking up because that's it's a pretty long bet on that and we're looking in the 27 and out kind of time frame there um, uh, in order to kind of stimulate the crypto certification, simplifying it by instead of it having the 10 different programs that have to work the same topic. If if you have one mission planning tablet that does that, now there's one point of contact with NSA that is going, has high repetition and frequency, but now we're not hitting NSA with 10 different requests from a like a PEO kind of perspective. Um, probably not a really satisfying answer, but it is an area that we're looking at, how do we simplify the equation 
uh, and how do we simplify it for the user? Um, and they could just plug that cord into their uh, UAS or plug that into their mission planning device, plug it into the UAS or a, a, a manned vehicle and hit a button and say, here's the crypto I want to load to these radios. And we use software as the digital glue to make sure that we route the information to the right radios. I'm glad someone brought that question up. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to talk about, or I can't yet, in terms of what we're doing, but I'd like to throw out to the group. Uh, typically, when we deal with these cross-domain solutions, right, these kind of red-black solutions, we talk about crypto, uh, the tendency has been to over-classify and over-protect. And that's a tremendous burden, not just to the fleet, but to developers and everything. So how do we, as a government industry team, get to a point working with our partners in the NSA that we have defined and robust boundaries where we can protect what we need to protect and re leave the, the rest of it at a classification where it's not impeding the speed? Because we know as soon as we go to a classified level, um, everything slows down. Putting it all behind the door or behind crypto is not the way to do it. And yet we come up and I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at Scott and we start talking about cross-domain solutions and how to do that in a timely manner or an elegant manner, shall I say. And I'm not sure we have an answer yet. So Chopper's working on a lot of stuff, trying to bring it down to, you know, one team, one fight, one weapon for the fight, but we also need to get better. And I would ask if anyone has any ideas on how to make that interface, that junction between the two worlds of classified and unclassified, uh, robust and simple. Because in addition to getting the keys, we're having trouble looking at, you know, certification for those types of boundaries. So I'll leave it there. It's a little bit of a turnaround the question, but things that I'm definitely very interested in hearing about. So. A little bit of an offshoot, but I mean, so I think that the, the biggest issue that I've seen, right, and I, if you look at Triton, we've got, I think, 10 higher than secret ATOs in parallel that we have to work. We have about half that many secret ATOs, right? All, for all these different components of the system. Um, the, the issue that I see, and I'll use us as the bad example, right, is, is we construct these systems, you know, at a moment in time based on a CDR that was held years ago. Um, clearly cyber doesn't work that way, right? So you, you're constantly having to pace the threat type mentality that requires flexibility to address those, those, those new threats popping up. So the architectures are built based on static requirements we need to get to a point where it's a modeling based system engineering approach, right? Where we are recognizing that what we don't know what the system will be when it deploys five, six, eight years down the road. And we gotta, we have to have an architecture that supports that construct fundamentally. Um, and so, you know, we have, we are constantly chasing our tail, right? To, in negotiation with all these different uh, authorities on what has to be put in and in many cases, we can't do it, right? And so then, we, then we have to then lay out POA and M's, and and you know that's that's all goodness. But the fundamental problem is that we are we are static, right? And so that to me, that's that's the biggest problem that we have in all these defense systems. Thank you. I'm going to take a question from online, which is, uh, in light of JAD C2 and ISR targeting, can you talk about your current requirements for real-time targeting and uh, what what barriers you might have in the future. Is it me or? I, why don't we start with you okay. and then we'll, we'll go to. Yeah, so. Uh, Got to be careful where we go on this one. I, I will just say that there is definitely a, um, a, a heavy focus from PEO and even and I, I there was a discussion yesterday with Janine talking about long range fires. There, there is a heavy focus on um, providing uh, multiple sourcing data to support support exactly what Dodger just said, right? Um, so we are all part of that. Um, and I, I, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but to just say that the, the solution is not a single solution, right? It's not a single cool jet or a single cool sensor. It's all and above, right? And under a under a um, DMO DSO architecture, right? So, I think in the old days of you know Top Gun, it was like I strap on my cool jet, I fire on my cool weapon, and I queue my own source. That that's that's over. That doesn't happen anymore, right? At the at the ranges we're talking. So, we are fundamentally tied into a a, a collaborative effort 
that extends beyond nav air um, right to multiple other groups air force navy space force etc and, and and the more we adopt that mindset and understand it the more we understand that we can't create stovepipe solutions they have to be solutions that are collaborative and drive to um, uh, correlated uh, data correlated data that improves tq So I know for the smalls, uh, our ISR services, what we used to do on land uh, with the global war on terrorism, we were we were focused more on uh, uh, identifying license plates and uh, facial recognition. But as we move to the sea side of things, it's more about uh, server search and, and identifying targets. So, you know, the fidelity of the cameras that, that and and that we're looking for when we start moving to the sea-based uh, exercises is much different than. What we traditionally have looked for uh, when we're doing our land-based efforts. So, I, I just say keep that in mind as we, as our mission changes. So does our requirement with uh, with some of the capabilities we put on our ISR ISR platforms. All right. So a secondary but very important mission for MQ25 and and unmanned carrier aviation is is ISR. Uh, as we put sensors downrange, as we put sensors farther away from um, the human decision makers. Uh, big concern about how a lot of the things that used to go on in this computer can happen in the computers on the aircraft. So uh, whether it's target identification classification at the source, uh, a radar and optic system that is doing it based on a, uh, a preset parameter, something I don't have to dynamically mission plan, Right. What, what class ship is that? What class aircraft is that? Feed that back to the operator so they can make a final decision. But a lot of that has to be, we have to get to where we can start doing a lot of that at the source far away and maybe cold, dark and quiet. So to go along with that, and I think we're, we're talking the same thing, uh, if we're going to feed that information back when we're doing uh, ISR, for us, that requires usually a beyond line of sight broadband solution, right? Lots of bandwidth that we're constantly searching for. The hunger for bandwidth never goes away. Um, but it also requires us to be very careful with the waveforms, the probability of intercept, right? The probability of detection, because I don't want to be out there blasting back to the ship or back to the shore that, hey, I see something and highlighting myself. So as we put the two together, onboard computing for the ISR mission, plus uh, LPI, LPD comms to get that information back to the human decision maker so we can then go forward and either prosecute a target or, or not, right? So it's not always about being kinetic. Sometimes just about understanding where the movements are so we can make better decisions behind the line. So in my mind, those two things go together, uh, especially for an autonomous platform like that, the, uh, the decision making at the source, and then I'm able to communicate that without highlighting my position. We have a question over here. <laughs> so uh, for those online, the question was about, um, so we we have plat manned platforms uh, that need the information that can't handle the bandwidth. We have unmanned platforms that are generating the information that don't have a place to bandwidth. So so who in the Navy is managing the pipes, uh, if I can paraphrase? And I'll, I'll let, I see Josh is. So the, the, the answer, right, if you ask up at the Pentagon is operation overmatch is kind of tasked with that and then they what they do is they engage with the PIOs at the syscoms and the PIO for nav air is, is two, PMA 298 under Mooch Campbell so that's that's the office that would be driving that engagement and interaction across the PMAs at nav air I don't know if you have any more to add there no, no. Yeah. 
Yes. There are plans in the way that that piece has been. Plan and or the path of the that piece. So uh, the question was about the MD5 GCS, which is the GCS for uh, MQ25, and is there a roadmap and plan for other platforms? It's a that that's a great question. As we try to go common, uh, sometimes common is good, sometimes common is bad. Uh, I, I'm not here to force the MD5 on anyone who already has an established ground control station. I will say, from unmanned carrier aviation perspective, those as I call them widgets that we're plugging into that backbone, the intent is to be common that the MD5, MDCX, as Lockheed Martin calls it, would be the common backbone for carrier aviation. Now, if we as a naval enterprise decide that we want to shift that way and be more common across all of our unmanned platforms, that that may work. But sometimes you can be too common, like I said, and it, it would actually might hurt. So it would be up to us to continue working together, talking about what the requirements for individual platforms are uh, to see if we could cross any other barriers outside of uh, where it's currently intended to go. Yeah. So, so I'll I'll just underline that right the you know, you know N98 has made, clearly stated that the future of carrier aviation is unmanned so, you know up to 60% unmanned is the future uh, there is only one ground control station that we're putting on aircraft carriers and that's the MD5 uh, so so we we, uh, <laughs> we 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 have planned for that eventuality and and the architecture is in there to support multiple UAS Okay, so I'm going to take a question from online because uh, they really want to hear from Fester. Um, they're feeling sorry that, that you didn't answer any questions. Um, so uh, it's it's really about uh, MQ8 and about um, you know doing. Um, are you going to do split operations? Uh, are the is the fleet thinking about deploying MQ8 by itself? And then uh, how about uh, contract ops and maintenance and and where that might play in your expeditionary role for MQ8? So that's more of a fleet question. We work closely with them, right? So they have had, they've had an operating model that they, and I said it in my opening remarks, that they operate with the Sierra debt. So, but as the tactics and techniques and procedures change for, for maybe a high-end fight or indo paycom fight, I think there's a lot of movement in the Navy, how we're operating differently uh, from, from, from top to bottom to left and right. So that's a possibility that we'd have to, to, to make sure that the wing pack, who, who, who is the Titan Model Series owner and CNAF, or CNAP actually, for Fire Scout, uh, how do they want to employ Fire Scout, right? If they, you know, a fester can sit up here and pitch expeditionary all day, but if they don't want to do that, then then they keep their current model and, and make it work, right? So if there's an expeditionary aspect of that and splitting debts and, and, and doing business differently, then things have to go differently, right? So from, from a former squadron commanding officer perspective, earlier notification is better than later notification, right? And does the fleet want to augment expeditionary operations, either Fire Scout or Reaper, right? The Marines are doing it right now, right? The, the Let me let me go down the Marine path a little bit. This this is a different operating environment, right? So they, they, they went from the VMUs, the fixed wing Marine unmanned squadrons, flying blackjacks and the things that Tom's talking about to a high end uh, group five ISR asset, right? So they need the capability now, they want the capability now. So how they did that was they're going to do contractor logistics support, uh, currently a competing contract right now on that uh, and, and some engineering logistics support reach back, right? So that's their current operating model. So it's possible, right? So as we we, we move into the realm of what how I deployed as a JO 20 years ago is not the way we're deploying unmanned right now. So there is a lot of industry involved, right? So if in fact the Navy wanted to go to an expeditionary uh, model and we didn't have the manpower to do that, then that's certainly something that the fleet would have to look at, right? Because there's a lot of great capacity and capabilities within industry to augment the fleet uh, to, to, to do air crew flying uh, UASs or to do maintenance at the O level, I level, or D level, right? So it's a menu options of really what, what, the, what the requirement is for the Navy to operate Fire Scout worldwide. From my perspective, I'm ready to 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 get involved in those conversations and see what's in the realm of the possible. The good news is that it's not news. Uh, um, so uh, well open to however the Navy wants to proceed, sir. Thank you. Question over here in the back.
So uh, the question was about uh, the implications of what we've seen in Ukraine and uh, how we might uh, take advantage of those going forward. So I know we'll let Tom start. Yeah, so um, the, the life of the average UAS in Ukraine is, is short, right? And so uh, as we are doing wartime planning and, and discussion about, you know, uh, do we need to stockpile parts? Uh, the lesson learned over there is is they're just buying a new, right? So we're trying to get our hands around that. You know, uh, should we go to war? Are we going to stockpile a bunch of Group One through Threes? Are we going to stockpile parts? Are we going to have forward deployed um, uh, capability to 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 help uh, do the maintenance on, on those assets? So. We're learning a lot from that. Also, we're seeing uh, some of the same jamming scenarios over in Ukraine that we see in our ISR land base efforts. And we're very interested in the uh, the sensors and payloads that they're using to overcome those and, and uh, pursuing some of those because they're low cost solutions that uh, obviously everything you're doing if there's low cost solutions. Um, so there is a lot to be learned, but but it's playing a, a a major role in what they're doing over there. You know, we our true as system, the the core air vehicle for that is a Malloy uh, TRV. Uh, they're all over the place in Ukraine. They're they're not carrying cargo. They're carrying munitions, and yeah, they're they're air dropping those munitions. Right. Um, that is not our role in life right now. But when we go to war, you can see that a creative marine how they're going to use that system. And we're, we're obviously not in a place to tell them no, okay? So uh, uh, we're watching that closely. That is not a requirement for us, but you know, when, when things go wrong, people get creative and, and we're watching that creativity closely and what's happening in Ukraine. So, so I think that's a good point, which is the, the feedback from the field users and, and how they're modifying it. So after Fester, maybe Chopper, I know you, with uh, Electronic Knee Board, you have a lot of experience with that. Here go, Fester. Fester's opinion is that, 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 that the conflict that you've mentioned has really been a game changer in the way warfare is done, right? Don't quote me on that one, but that's Fester's opinion, right? So what does that mean? Uh, is that for unmanned platforms, we talked about, you know, adding sensors to, to unmanned trucks to do various things. Well, there's also, and Tom mentioned it, I think that you'd call them air launch effects or something like that. There's a lot of work out there that's possible to do that, even from a, from a, Scott perspective, if that was a requirement to do that, then it'd be a compressed air launch type system that that that, that doesn't have to come back. To Admiral's earlier point, you know, what what's autonomy? Uh, my question is what's a tritable? What's considered a tritable, right? What can come back? What doesn't have to come back? Uh, there's a cost in the dollar, and I think Tom talked about that, right? Putting a five hundred thousand dollar system on a three hundred thousand dollar drone. Hmm, there's an e economic problem, right? So I think those conversations, thanks for the question. I think that will be coming in the future about, hey, what's what can come back? Is a UAV a weapon system or is it a platform for weapon system or is it both? And is it okay that both of them don't come back in a, in a high-end fight? So that's my comments. Uh, our, our TrueAS system, like I said, 330K, but 10 clicks one way, but there's a lot of discussions going on that, you know, if I need to get Band-Aids, bullets, or blood, you know, to a Marine forward deployed, maybe uh, it goes 20 clicks one way and never comes back. But uh, that's the price you pay for uh, getting the Marines what they need when they need it. Stuff just motivates me, Tom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I think a, a piece of this that I think about a lot is how do I set up and how do I engage with industry to deliver capability at agility and pace? Agility being how can we uh, rapidly take new requirements that the warfighter needs, adapt to those requirements and fill them in a timely manner, in a relevant manner. And so I think, you know, learning from current combat operations is is the ultimate test for our business right of can we adapt rapidly and provide uh industrial uh industry and government partnership that is gonna gonna do that so i see um a, a major advantage in using stuff like 
we have a whole electronic kneeboards line that where we take tablets. Actually, some of the aviators in here, for example, uh, probably didn't fly with a uh, an iPad uh, in the cockpit. But our young aviators right now that are going through the training command, they all fly with iPads. They have four flight uh, subscriptions on them. Uh, where they have automated information telling them about where unclassified uh, no tams are getting updated or weather or, or inf information about how to just fly. That's just normal to them. Like doing that on a piece of paper seems kind of kind of old school. And so taking that idea of doing what we all the way you probably got here today, like Google Maps, Apple Maps, Waze, whatever your navigation tool is, and adapting those types of technologies to the warfighting domain is something that we're looking at, uh, kind of creating a version of like airways where um, either aviators or maybe it's um, Marines on the ground who have a tablet uh, that already controls the weapon system, but now we're pumping in information that might be uh, here are threats. Uh, here are other UAVs that are in your space. Uh, and, and doing that not in some like really expensive way, but just leveraging some of the commercial tools that are already out there. But we put it in a, a DevSecOps pipeline that you've heard a couple times from me uh, so that we get that to the to the warfighter in the form of an electronic kneeboard or tablet that allows them to have information dominance in that space. Now, what's important to me in that with industry is, are you building agile software development teams? Are you building teams that uh, can take requirements and deliver capabilities? Like, hey, here's a, this Marine needs this feature in two weeks. Okay, is your team posture to, to contract, you know, to deliver that uh, on these agile timelines that we see at, uh, at a major information technology company? And how do we leverage those best practices to get them to the fleet? So I think I have a way to get uh, devices, at least for aviators to the fleet. I'm doing that now. I've got over 4,000 electronic new boards uh, out in the fleet, and we're looking at putting out more. Uh, we have classified tablets that go out to the fleet. Um, we're looking at doing that uh, in a more robust way in the future. Uh, so having industry solutions that are not only thinking about how we do that on aviator tablets, um, but how that, uh, we have defined how does that play into an unmanned space. But I see the ability, I can get a lot of processing power out to a fleet operator in a, in a tablet uh, if I've got the right types of applications on there. And, and we have a few that are fielded. We have a bunch of co close combat air solutions, um, uh, SNC, ATAC, uh, that, that allows people to do um, uh, get munitions on target with, uh, with JTACs that are fielded today. So it's not all new, but we could use more, uh, more in that space. Yeah, the only other thing I'll mention, just back to the original question, is um, uh, what I've seen in my program is very what we see at the macro level, right, was the war strengthened, frankly, our NATO partnerships at a macro level. We've seen the same thing in the PMA. So we we were not necessarily in a strong sharing mode, and we are now strongly in a strong sharing mode with the NATO AGS partnership. So just yesterday, we had a three-hour meeting with NATO walking through numerous use cases. So very positive, frankly. Thank you, Vlad, but very positive to help us strengthen that alliance. So I wanted to go back because uh, Chopper mentioned pace and, and uh, you know, we know from the threat brief uh, that our need to deliver product on schedule or ahead of schedule has never been more acute. Could you talk about uh, what you are doing with your programs to deliver on schedule and what barriers you might have in, in meeting the schedule that you would like? Uh, I'll look at Silly first. Thank you, sir. Okay. You made the easy ones. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> MQ-25 production has had challenges. That's anybody not heard that? The news? No. Yeah. Uh, we, we're doing a lot of things to advance the state of production in aircraft. A lot of good stuff. Uh, lead ship program for a lot of things. And sometimes we need to control appetite on what we're lead ship program for. All that being said, how are we trying to get back on schedule? I credit my Boeing partners for working seven days a week, right? T 
two, sometimes three shifts a day. For us, it's a production problem. We have to put that together. We're constantly looking for opportunities. Where did we overreach in a requirement? Where did we, I'm not going to say gold plate, but where do we ask for too much? Where did we fail to control our appetite? What can we get to the fleet now? On a previous program, uh, F-18 Erst, that was behind two. And we ended up sending the block one pods to the fleet with block two algorithms in them. And my mantra then was, that may be 65% of the final requirement for that system, but it was 100% of what the fleet needed today because they didn't have anything. I don't have quite the advantage that I did back then because I had systems to send to the fleet. So what we're doing today is trying to make sure that we have worked through every possible scenario in terms, and working very closely with the fleet, by the way. I don't want anyone to think that we're doing this in a vacuum. Uh, they are there with us all the way. What can you accept? What can you hold on? What do you really need today? What's good? What's good enough? And when you're facing a peer threat, what's good enough for now to get it out there as close as we can to the fight tonight? So focusing on good enough for now, focusing, working hard with the fleet on, on pulling back, being flexible. We've changed almost everything. Sometimes in acquisition, we get a contract and there's ink on the bottom of it, and that's what it says, and that's what you do. Thanks for signing up to it. That, for our program, is not going to work. It's very much in the 268 family, in the MQ-25 family, the past is forgotten. How do we work together? How do we open up? We haven't opened up contracts, but how do we open up in terms of what we're willing to help each other out with? Uh, and I will tell you, in the past six months, the program has lurched forward in terms of where we were uh, back in February, March, just working through problems and where we are today, not only in the engineering problems, but in the relationships that we have. And sometimes we forget that we're all people working together, trying to get to a common goal. All right, we have contracts, we have money, we have things we have to do to get there, but we're all people working together to try and support the warfighter. So building those relationships has gotten the program moving forward. Notice I haven't thrown many things about technicals or ones and zeros or drilling holes better, anything like that. And all the progress we have seen has come down to flexibility, parsing out when or what part of the requirement gets out there, not holding something back from the fleet to get them perfect. And then building the relationships with amongst one our, you know, our government program offices, which sometimes we stovepipe ourselves, and then building the relationships with all of you in industry, looking for innovative new ways, accepting disruptive technologies that push an old requirement to the side. I don't need to do that anymore because it's new technology. Hence, we're all here today asking you, what can you bring, right? Bring those disruptive technologies. I'm not against cutting an old technology if it's, I don't need sailing ships anymore. I've got steamships. Now I got nuclear powered ships, right? So um, relationships. Relationships are really how we're getting to move the program forward and get the warfighter what it needs quicker. All right. We are behind. We are rushing to catch up. But every day in every way, a little better and better, right? It's baby steps. And that, that's how we've had progress over the past seven months. So I'll just uh, pile on to that. So two years ago, right, leaving the Pentagon, I don't know anybody in the Pentagon that thought we were going to get to IOC based on our timeline. And and so it was kind of a one last shot kind of deal, but the the, the, the key was the transparency, right? So um, what I what I saw, right, was walking in the door, based a, tra tra a radically transparent relationship with our prime and with our sub vendors based on a relationship of a trust where on a daily, weekly basis, we drove down, we were able to drive down those information asymmetries, right? They're, they're usually not unknown unknowns. We get those, but very rarely. It, somebody knows, but folks are either afraid or there's a culture that prevents acknowledgement of a problem. And then we wait till the 11th hour and then we have the blow up. So transparency, but it has to be built based on that trusting relationship where, where the customer is not always right. Right. We 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 as a customer really need to really recognize that we are not usually right, frankly. Right. So um, that that's what got us to IOC on time. Right. It wouldn't it wouldn't have happened. If, but for those those daily conversations that required painful movement on both the government side as well as the industry side, it wasn't a one sided street. So I, I see that extend, though, beyond just a development environment to a, a contract negotiation environment. Right. We. 
we enter we end up these contracts where we get a proposal the proposal doesn't say what we thought it should say we stare at each other for months in a protracted standoff simply because we are not willing to drive the informal fact finding necessary to grab alignment and then work the last little piece which really should be the negotiation so that drives timelines then we award contracts in a cost plus environment with extended or with, with, with timelines that aren't realistic based on overblown requirement sets that can never be achieved. That is problematic. And then again, we get into the development space where it, it perpetuates because of misalignment and folks not being willing to talk to each other. So to me, fundamentally, it's building that relationship of trust with transparency that gets us gets us there quicker. Um, and, and, and make sure that our stakeholders of the Pentagon have alignment on what's actually possible not over promising under delivery. Our <clears throat> ISR services stuff makes us uh, look at a problem set pretty differently. Um, we have folks that are out in the pointy end of the spear out in the desert now helping ops. And uh, every once in a while, our, our IPT lead reaches back and says, hey, uh, I got a problem. I got a blue on blue jammer. I, I have stopped flying. I need to get uh, I need to get UASs back in the air. How do we get there? And the mindset, you know, in the PMA at one point was, well, you know, I got a lab that has a solution and with $2 million and two years from now, we can give you the gold plated solution. And his, you know, he pushes the envelope to say, no, I need to get back flying within weeks, not within years. And so that, that, that has changed the paradigm shift a little bit and how we approach things in, in 263. Um, at, at one point in my life, I was a act person on the PEO staff and I was the acquisition police. And now I use my powers for good, right? Um, because uh, it's almost like, you know, the rules of the game, you know, where the seams are, you know, when you, when you're working in the building and you come across the land of no, um, you know, you use your network to uh, make a phone call and overcome that land of no, because the sense of urgency is real, and as we learned on uh, day one, it's only going to get realer if flag goes up, right? So, uh, uh, understanding those boundaries, like he, like I think Silly said, uh, what is the true requirement to get people back up and flying? You don't need that gold plated, plated solution. Yeah, that's great to have and work towards uh, long term. But uh, in our scenario, we need to get eyes back in the sky so operations can continue and we had to change the mindset in the pma about parsing through the requirement and figuring out what can we give our team so that they can continue flying and and that just that changes the way our our folks look at a problem and even the way our contracts folks approach the problem so uh yeah we're, we're getting a little taste of that now I just agree with everything that Josh said. Uh, transparency, you heard that from me yesterday, and that is still a foot stomper for me is transparency, trust, and teamwork, and how can we outlearn our adversaries together? Like individual learning doesn't count. It's only the the team's collective knowledge that actually gets us to to the next step. So here, here to what Josh said. You're all great speakers and great Americans. So I'll build on that. Just the, is there's transfer, there, there's transformation as well that's had to happen. You know, uh, having gone through standard programs and went through Defense Acquisition University, I thought I knew it all. And then Mux was handed to me, the the MACTEF unmanned expedition or MQ9, medium not too long endurance, right? So here's some requirements. Here's our dates. Good luck, Fester. Okay, so it's been an enterprise change for us as well. So we, really a lot of inspection, transparency, you guys said relationships and adapting to that. Uh, so we, we've changed the paradigm. I think it said we, we're on the MUX side of the house, uh, we started doing agile program management. So we're doing Scrum. Uh, that's working right now. That's just really chunking out a whole super wicked problem into, into edible bites, uh, creating iterative value and making sure that we keep on schedule, right? So uh, we're doing that inside the house. The 
Mux program on paper looks like an ACAT too, but we, with the with the benevolence and a great partnership with the PEO, were able to use the rules appropriately. And it, there's too many KPPs and KSAs to manage on an ACAT too, so we were able to chunk those out because I don't want one sensor holding the whole program up. So we have some abbreviated acquisition programs. We have some. MTAs, we have some OTAs going on, and we're doing business differently uh, with our partnerships with our bosses, the PEO, and with the industry, with our friends down the street here. Uh, so it's just a different way of doing business to, to, to be able to deliver capability to the Marines, to the warfighters when we say that we're going to do that. Uh, but it takes industry sitting at the table with us, uh, and that transparency is a very important word, and that relationship is a very important world. And that way, we're not, you just say, staring at each other for, for two months, looking at each other with a stone face. Uh, we want to avoid that because it doesn't work in this environment. So from 266 pr perspective, it's been a transformation change, at least on the MUX po profile. Thank you. I, I just want to add that uh, from my seat, um, I, I've never seen a more challenging environment for program continuation. The the pre you know, we counted a lot on uh, bureaucratic initiative or inertia uh, and the sunk cost fallacy that that we could a program that was started would continue. Uh, given the environment that we're in, any delays in any program become a serious discussion about whether it's worth it to continue. Um, so I think it's incumbent on all of us to to really execute our programs at pace and and deliver. Uh, and that's really important to keep programs sold in the building. Um, any other questions? I, I, there's one over here. Uh, can I do up front first? So the, for the online, the questions was about open standards for small UAS. Uh, which ones are we using in our partnership with the Army, particularly in launch defects and small UAS? So we have an Army liaison in our office. Um, he checked on board. We had him spend uh, a period of time with each one of our teams, and then we sent him to Huntsville to hang out with Colonel Medaglia and her team. And we're keeping those lines of communication open. She's watching what we're doing. We're watching what she's doing. Um, uh, they have adjusted their JTARS requirement to match our true as requirement because uh, they see the pace at which we're going. Now, don't mean to bash the army, but they can't even get out of their own way to buy two of them and test them in 24. So uh, that's a whole nother discussion. But anyway, we are watching what they're doing. As far as open standards, I I know that uh, if you're not born face compliant in the Army, um, then you're not playing in their sandbox. We have not dictated a particular open standard. Um, I know that within the walls of what we're doing, we are working on what's called a Suez reprogrammable architecture. Uh, we put a lot of effort into if you design your system this way, we can fast track you to a flight clearance and we can fast track you to a cybersecurity certification. Uh, we have been through the testing on that and we're about to go uh, public with that. And we're working here with 281, who's got a new lease on life and what they're doing to figure out how can we use what you're doing to uh, promulgate that information. Um, but so, you know, uh, we are not dictating a particular open standard at this time. Uh, at the pace we're going, uh, we, we can't afford to just dictate that and, and have everyone take what they're working on today and put it in that particular standard. We're, we're watching the Army go pretty slow because of that. And uh, the pace we're going, we're just choosing not to go in that direction. Thank you. Yeah. So I appreciate that, and that's a very interesting point, right? What are what are we doing joint wise for 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 UAS? 
ask me ask me six months ago, I, I don't know. But what what we're doing, and this was Colonel Modalja's idea actually from the Army, is that we we're, we're kicking back off conversations with the government uh, with with UAS at large. So uh, there was something that was in the past where we all met. I think it turned into a big status brief. Uh, didn't seem value added. So. Based on the colonel down there, we're doing the Council of Eagles. So from the Army, the Air Force, uh, the Border Patrol, I don't know if they have Eagles, I think they do. Um, and then the Coast Guard, they're going to come up here in the end of October. We're going to round table. I think all my friends up here are going to be part of that. That way we can understand what they're doing as well. So those questions we need to talk about inside the house with, with, the, D, we, with the DOD and the joint UAS world. And then I think we're better positioned to come to industry saying, hey, I think the, actually the Air Force is doing that or they're the lead on that. So we're taking a lot of steps within the, the leadership here at this table and within our counterparts of all the, of the UAS services to, to make sure that we understand what the joint UAS world is doing. And that way we're able to, able to have better discussions with the industry. I just wanted to add that. Oh, Tom Scott. So, uh, Colonel Medaglia and I were classmates in a DAU class. So, while she was getting ready to take her next job and I was getting ready to take this job, we, we solved world hunger sitting next to each other. And, uh, yeah, so we, we are keeping those lines of communication open. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, we did, we did try and solve all the world's problems in four weeks sitting next to each other at DAU. Yes. Thanks, Tom. There's another question back here. Okay, so the question was about swarm technology. First part was uh, from a group one to group three perspective, have we defined the requirements? Uh, and then for Chopper, how are you integrating swarm control into mission planning? Swarm is not a, a formal requirement that it's made its way to 263 at this time. We, we uh, our advanced development lead is, is watching that and, and noticing what they're doing with that technology and and those configurations and and the possibilities um but no that requirement has not made its way to us um that's all i really communicate on that uh yeah from the mission planning side you know a uh, couple of years down the road I, I used maybe i mentioned that as an example of the complexity of the war fighting environment that we would mature into on uh, a many, you know, one to many relationship means it's stressing mission planning, networks, communications, comms. So what we are looking at is uh, we also don't have a requirement uh, uh, in, in that way, but we are deeply looking at how do you set up the digital architecture to adapt to many types of different types of mission sets? Uh, and and then it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at um, what are some of the things that are happening in industry and how could we uh, adapt industry solutions. And then what I'm very much focused on is agility and pace. How can you take existing research and development? I'm not going to go invest a bunch in research and development, but how can I capitalize on that and get it to the fleet? How, how can I get it the last mile? So I would say that that type of technology is just one example of a challenging technology of a range of many that we are trying to build the software architecture, culture, uh, and um, acquisition flexibility using stuff like the software acquisition pathway to be able to respond to those, whatever a complex kind of mission demand might be. I, I guess for the benefit of all, um, if you have a new emerging technology and uh, you're looking to run it through its paces, uh, for us, we use McQuill. That's the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab. That is the right organization to solicit. And uh, they do a lot of uh, demonstrations and, and fleet user experimentation. And as those things evolve, then they usually make their way into requirements and make their way into our portfolio. That is the right organization to cut your teeth on some of these uh, emerging technologies. I, and I'll just add, uh, you know, from from my perspective, 
you know, think about the, you know, the Navy Marine Corps team and, and what we talked about our employment, you know, scope of employment. We're going to be distributed. Uh, we're going to be at long ranges and we're going to be fighting a fight that's a long way from any of us. And so one of the issues with swarm is how would we mass forces to actually have a swarm uh, when we're going to be so geographically separated? So uh, thanks for the question. That was a long one, so I'm just going to give the short version uh, for the people online. Uh, the question was about manned unmanned teaming and where do we see it going across the various platforms? I'll take the first shot on that. So look at the FireSky MQHC. If, you, if, you, if you're able to see my brief on Monday or Tuesday, they've been doing it for, for years, right? So you're talking about a probably uh, from the Army's 2013 definitions and interoperability level of five from the ground to the air to use the sensors, the the air vehicle to do what they need, comms relay, all of it, right? So that's a very good man-to-man -man teaming. If you're talking about my portfolio in particular, about UAS to UAS teaming, we're not there yet, right? And, and some of the, uh, that's air to air, air to ground, air to UUV, uh, we have a lot of work to do on that. So you're right, it is a requirements, but what I'm looking for is also, I know there's some industry working to figure out the government reference architecture for that, uh, those command and control nodes between the air vehicles. Uh, I don't want to go off on a stovepipe and Fester will make this stuff up on his own. So I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for the end result of that. I think that lays a foundation into the force and saying, hey, what do we want my UASs to do? Besides Fester's pipe dreams of UASs talking to each other, what the fleet want? And I'm there to pr provide the solution. Over. I'll just hit real quick. Uh, there's a series of demos that uh, the SCO kicked off, uh, a, a demo called Avatar on um, that 281. We're transitioning some of that technology um, uh, where you're controlling uh, as surrogates unmanned um, drones. Uh, so our PMA 208 brethren, uh, Greg Cruz, who was up here yesterday, we partner closely with them um, on, on that being kind of a, we could talk more about some of the work that we've done there. Interest time will pass on. Uh, that's a work in progress, you know, uh, uh, I think everyone is so focused on making their individual systems work and meet mission needs that uh, uh, talking across is is uh, a secondary thing that we're trying to get our arms around. I know that, uh, again, watching what's happening in Ukraine, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of series of meetings, at least within Marine Corps side of the house, where you're talking the, the uh, unmanned aircraft, then you're talking the ground piece, then you're talking the air launch effects, you know, who has got the dot to get their arms around that collectively and how are we going to fight in theater using the family of systems? I don't think we have focused on putting our arms around that yet. And that is a work in progress as all these things start to mature and come together. Um, I think that that is a work in progress. The dish, you you already, I mean, DSO obviously is built on on man on man teaming. I'll, I'll I'll focus more on MPRA since I think you were honed in on that. So Triton coming in the door, right? IFC four was built on basically going across the street to 290 Echo with the EP three and trying to grab their expertise to start the integration work. 
that that bubble has now moved where that work is now resident within 262. We now own the MISD budget. The MISD budget is agnostic to platform. It's specifically tied on developing subsystems that are targeted at numerous platform, manned and unmanned. P8, bring it on increment three, that architecture, which was brought in by then Captain Rossi, supports a lot of expansion. So will the requirements drive that? Personally, I believe they will. Yeah, absolutely. Because what we're going to see is we're going to see the paycom demand signals. We're going to see things that uh, unmanned can do, and we're going to see things that they can't do. Um, smaller platforms can't do everything, right? And so that will then drive a demand signal. And I believe P8 particularly is ready to stand up and grab that demand signal. Positive thing I saw, COG last week, you were there, was a very strong shift, frankly, in the community from not, not only ASW to recognizing that in the seventh fleet AOR, we got a lot of additional uh, skills that we need to go in and refine. So uh, really awesome. It's interesting because you ask four people a question, you'll get four different answers, right? But I think it all comes from where we sit. If you look at the breadth of unmanned platforms on the stage, you have small, medium, a couple of large, and then a couple of large with different levels of autonomy which is probably a little game changer in the way that I look at manned on man teaming. So being an old tactical uh, fighter pilot, you always think of your wingman, right? I didn't need to control my wingman all the time. My wingman didn't off and, and did something that we had briefed they would do. So for me, when we start talking about MQ-25, we start talking about collaborative combat aircraft, things like that. Aircraft that we anticipate as we move forward in this unmanned realm of having higher levels of autonomy. When I discuss with the requirements officers up the road, I try to get them out of thinking in terms of command and control, where we've traditionally thought of manned on man teaming. And in some cases, it's applicable, right, via the control schemes. But the way we see it going now, and you've heard me talk about a little bit in, in my intro, was how do we get away from purely command and control and get into a kill matrix, or at least we always had kill chains and then kill webs, which start thinking three dimensionally, multiple nodes, kill matrices. How do I have platforms that contribute to this matrix? Do what they're supposed to do, contribute information. Maybe you take control for a moment to retask, but we're not babysitting it like we would think in terms of early UAVs, things like that. So from my perspective, uh, that's where we're trying to take it. Now we have to control the appetite, right? We have to get the MQ-25 out there. We have to learn to get off the front, get on the back safely and repeatably and then go out 500 miles and pass some fuel. But we can't stop thinking about the future as we're trying to build the today. So from us, and as I as I discussed with, I think several people as, as we were chatting over here, how do we get to that point where an MQ-25 or collaborative combat aircraft in a manned unmanned teaming role is contributing autonomously, not just being controlled to go do somewhere and do a pre-planned mission. Uh, that would be a huge game changer and a huge asymmetric advantage for all of us. Right, as I can send things over there and say, go do that. Well, we either don't launch or we go take care of something over here with man platform. So. So I'm going to do one short question, and then we're going to get to wrap up. So for uh, from online for Tom, can you talk about the blue UAS program and, and how uh, you're leveraging that to get systems into the hands of Marines? So uh, <clears throat> blue AUS is. Uh, uh, that's predominantly being run at a DIU. Um, there's been a lot of working groups on that lately. Uh, if you're on the list of, of UASs that could be purchased on Blue UAS, uh, that allows the, uh, uh, the different commands to buy those things with their own resources. Um, how are we playing in it? We we are worried about the things that they're going to buy and how they're going to have flight clearances and ATOs. So I think what our play in that is going to be is, is how we help uh, the different commands that are off buying these smalls obtain those flight clearances and ATOs. So our near-term action is outlining the process and figuring out how we can help uh, fast track that, but um, there there is a need for uh, the different Marine commands to, to just have these things in their repertoire and DIU has come up with a list 
this blue UAS list of things that you're able to buy. We do worry about the training, right? Uh, the way we currently do with our smalls today, we have we have uh, uh, training and logistics support activities. There's five of them geographically dispersed across the U.S. For everything we buy, Marines come. We're, we're the inv inventory control point for that. Marines come, they check them out, they train with them, and then when they go and deploy, they deploy with them. And then when they come back off deployment, they check them back in. We RFI them and the process starts over again. When you start letting the different commands buy whatever they want to buy, uh, low dollar solutions, you know, how are they going to, uh, uh, how is that going to be interoperable? Are, are they going to be trained to use them? Who's going to support them? I think the, uh, the near term uh, approach to that is they'll all be attributable. And if they go down, they go down. But again, that's the the low dollar solutions they're looking to have in their hip pocket when they deploy in an, uh, above and beyond what we're providing in our program of record for smalls. Thank you. Thank you. So um, as we wrap up, I just ask each one of you to uh, within your own area of responsibility, uh, what's the thing that bugs you the most? What's the thing that keeps you up at night? And because I don't need to like to leave on a down note, uh, what after that, what is are you most excited about? So we'll start at this end with Fester. <laughs> I needed time to think. <laughs> I'm thinking on the fly. Uh, what bothers me most uh, is that I feel, and I think the Admiral kicked us off well on Tuesday, we're in a pinch. And that's all of us, right? We're, we're, we're somewhat in a pinch, right? So we're getting out of a counterinsurgency fight and moving into whether whatever's happening in Ukraine or Eastern Europe, that's very, uh, that's very game changing. And then as we as we move our business models to uh, doing things differently with you great Americans out here uh, in the audience of industry and partners, uh, we, we got to change the way we're doing business together. And I think we're all aligned to do that. So that kind of makes me sit up at night and wonder where I'm at. Uh, but on the good news thing, I, I think that we have the right team uh, here at NAVAIR, the right uh, the right focus at NAVAIR, uh, NAVWAR, NAVC, all our systems are together. I think we have good relationships with the, the DOD now uh, under the, um, just what we're all trying to do, right? So I think that's a good news story. I'm happy to be here. Uh, what keeps me up at night is uh, cyber. Uh, so, um, us going into a high end fight and somebody turning around, uh, and saying, Hey, chopper, all those mission planning systems out there, are they secure? We, we just got hacked by an adversary. What's her state? Um, and then I'm going to turn to my chief engineer and I'm going to say, Hey, what's our state? And he's going to call some industry partners who put in code, right? And it's going to just spider web into people. Do they understand the code that they have either procured, developed, bought, whatever, just like supply chain management, but for software, do you know your stuff? Do you know what is in your computer? Um, because I'm gonna have to answer a question in a couple days of, are we secure? Are we safe to plan on that, that software that we, that we got from industry and we filled it out? Um, and the answer is probably there's holes. Um, so then what um, what I see as a positive is that um, if we can collectively uh, recruit, retain, recognize the great cybersecurity professionals and potential we have in this country, uh, this next generation of, of, of workforce uh, members that are just think digital, don't, don't think about printing out a piece of paper. Um, they they think in a way um, that is going to lead us into the next fight. Um, how do we engage them? How do we bring them uh, into the DOD uh, and into this government and industry workforce so that they understand, uh, have the teamwork, transparency, the culture that allows them to put out the agile solution that is whatever the technical debt and holes that we inherited with the, the software systems that we've bought in the past, they can patch it in a week. Is our current answer of like, hey, we just got hacked. Hey, when can we fix it? I don't know, in a year? There's too many ships at the bottom of the ocean in a year. It's not an acceptable answer. So that's what keeps me up at night, but I also have hope 
that we can motivate our workforce and engage and team in a way that we don't accept that we can't do that change and like deliver code in like 24 hours field it to the fleet. So I think it's possible. I guess what keeps you up at night is uh, uh, are we giving the Marines what they need to fight and win? You know, uh, we talk about the threat, but in many cases, our Marines are there now. And until I got to 263, I didn't realize how UAS's play and what they do and how they fulfill their mission. So uh, are we giving them what they need? Are we giving them the quantities they need? Are they going to operate in theater? Uh, when we have uh, different jamming and PNT scenarios, that that's what keeps us up at night. Um, what are we excited about? The unmanned logistics uh, piece of our portfolio. You know, the experimentation we've done with Truez it would take days for some of these Marines to hump that stuff to uh, where it needs to get, and instead we're giving it to a matter of hours. And then on the heels of Truez, the small, you have Marvel, the uh, the medium. Again, it's going to change the way we, we get the logistic support to our Marines, uh, keep some of our, our helos out of harm way, our, our manned aircraft out of harm's way. I think it's a game changer. Um, we have an uh, uphill battle with that, though, with, with policy and, and how we support the ground command with these capabilities uh, when they're forward deployed. But uh, we're, we're, we're up for, for taking on those challenges. So I, I would say quite literally what keeps me up at night is uh, sustainment, right? So for those of you that have worked platform in service platforms, you know what I'm talking about, right? So the reality is when in service platform, it's 24 seven task. And then when you, when you couple that with, um, you know, we're in one orbit, we're going to be standing up two more orbits, six and fifth fleet. It, it, the task is going to become significant and for, for unmanned, right? When we talk sustainment, what, what are we talking about? It's all the themes you've already heard about. It's it's beyond just the aircraft and the spares and the parts position that you would see with traditional platform. You're talking about shore infrastructure. You're talking about networks. You're talking about cyber. You're talking about all these various pieces and threads, any one of which can bring down that serial relationship, which then brings the aircraft into a standing halt. So all of that is a constant juggling act to try to get to keep these aircraft in flight and ready to support the war fight, right? Critical. Um, so that's what keeps me up at night. I'll just go back to the same thing that I talked about before. What gives me confidence and hope and excitement is the um, is the transparency and the relationships that we have with our industry uh, primes and subs. Um, we're charting new territory, right? And and I'm excited about where we're going. We're going to have some hit hits, I'm sure, along the way. But I'm very excited about the path that we're on to kind of chart the the course for DSO for the Navy. What keeps me up at night? Time keeps me up at night. Time is the one thing that we never have enough of in this business. Uh, we're behind and we're rushing to catch up. We as a nation are behind and we're rushing to catch up. So time keeps me awake. I have five points that I always tell my team, but the very last one is move like there's no tomorrow because there may not be. Right? And they've embraced that and we're doing everything we can to pull it left. But what excites me, we are standing on the dawn of a new age in aviation, if not naval aviation. All of us sitting up here, all of us that to get to work with the unmanned. How often can you truly say, how many lifetimes does it take to be able to say that you stood at the dawn at a golden age of aviation? I know most of us as, as aviators and naval aviators look at the 30s and 40s as kind of the golden age of naval aviation, right? Man, that was... It would have been incredible to be around then. It is incredible to be here right now. Sometimes things just fall into your lap that you never expected, and I could not imagine with all the cool programs that I've done, uh, being anywhere else but here doing this with all of you and these folks on the stage. So the future is bright. Time is of the essence. It's up to us to go out and take it. So let's go do it. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, we're going to love to continue today the one-on-one the -on -one interactions, and, and we'll be available for at least a little bit longer after this, and over to Brad for uh, what comes next.
Okay, we're pretty uh, pretty much on time for the agenda, so a 20-minute break. Be back, and we'll start promptly at 11. Thanks.
Okay, welcome back. Um, we're now going to kind of shift gears a little bit and focus on some surface and subsurface uh, entities. And uh, two of our presenters are going to be presenting remotely. Uh, our next presenter, Rob Ayara, uh, is going to be presenting remotely. You'll see the slides. Uh, for those of you in this room, you'll see the slides up on the screen. You will not see him um, uh, on the screen, but you will be able to uh, hear him. Um, uh, Rob, are you with us? Can you hear us? I am. Can you guys hear me? We can. Uh, and Shelly, slides. You got his slides up? Rob, all yours. All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Rob Ayara. I'm the Deputy Program Manager for PMS 340 Naval Special Warfare in PEO Unmanned and Small Combatants located up here at the Navy Yard. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to brief today. Uh, I know, I, I think I'm standing between you guys and lunch, uh, so I'll try to keep this brief. So today I'm going to provide an overview of our unmanned efforts uh, in support of Naval Special Warfare. Um, since this is a public forum, though, details will be limited and very high level. If you have any follow up afterwards, you guys can contact me separately and we can provide more detail at um, CUI or classified levels. Uh, next slide, please. And you can jump one more. All right, thank you. So PMS 340, Naval Special Warfare, acquires fields and sustains equipment and systems for both the Navy and Naval Special Warfare under Special Operations Command or US SOCOM. Here you can see some of the capabilities we deliver and the pictures. We are the major program manager for Navy Small Arms, Navy Visual Augmentation Systems, NSW's combat support, including soft combat diving and Navy airborne operations programs, NSW service common munitions, and other rapid capabilities development or ST efforts. We also manage efforts for SOCOM such as the Mark 8 Mod 1 Seal Delivery Vehicles or SDV, the Mark 11 SDV, a small UUV program, and a small USV program. We also handle other classified efforts not depicted here. Today we're going to talk about the unmanned systems. Uh, next slide. Okay, so specifically for our unmanned systems in 340, we manage both small UUVs and small USVs in support of special operating forces. Our small UUV enables access to contested denied areas in the maritime domain, provides maritime special reconnaissance capabilities, and reduces risk to personnel and crewed platforms. We leverage Navy service common small UUV systems uh, that we work with PMS 408 on the expeditionary side and install soft specific payloads. We are interested in industry's capabilities for payloads and sensors as well as long term sustainment for these vehicles. That will be in 25 and the out years. We also have a small USV program. Our approach is to procure commercial off the shelf modular systems that house government as well as industry payloads in support of mission requirements. Our small USV is divided into two endurance categories. We have a short endurance, which is addressing missions lasting a few hours and long endurance to address missions lasting weeks to months. So just like the UUV, we are also interested in industry's capabilities for payloads and sensors as well as long term sustainment. Again, both in 25 and the out years. Um, the only thing I'll add is that both of these are still uh, being delivered and some are in testing or or some type of competitive testing and demo environment. So we're still in the early days of these efforts, um, but we will have more information available probably starting next year going into 25. Um, again, that's that's pretty much all I have for today's industry days engagement uh, due to the classification. You can see some of the timelines and technologies we're looking for, though. And again, if you would like to discuss in a CUI or classified setting, we have a lot more information to provide. So please reach out directly and I'll connect you with our unmanned team. And that's all I've got for today. Thank you. Uh, Rob, can you still hear us and can you take some questions? I can hear you. Yep. Okay. Do we have any questions for Rob? We'll spec up side. Um, Rob, uh, folks would like to know how they reach you directly. Ah, my email. I yeah, I wasn't sure if you guys had a um, 
a list of presenters. So my email address is just Robert. Dot Iera India Echo Romeo Alpha at Navy dot mil. Shoot me a note and we'll connect you with our unmanned team. OK, any other questions? Uh, any questions from uh, teams online? OK, any questions in the room? OK, Rob, thanks for um, uh, thanks for dialing in for us. Uh, appreciate it. Hey, thank you out here. OK, everybody, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. We'll have about an hour and 45 minutes for lunch. Uh, Admiral, do you want to say anything before we break for lunch? OK, everybody, we'll see you back and we'll start uh, at 1300.